All right, I'd like to welcome uh, to the show uh, Joshua D. Rothman. He is the professor of history at the University of Alabama, author of his uh, most recent, The Ledger and the Chain, How Domestic Slave Traders Shaped America. Uh, uh, professor, I'm here with uh, Emma Vigeland. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. So let's start with um, 1808. Okay. This is, the, uh, this is when the United States banned the transcontinental slave trade, uh, or the transatlantic, I guess I should say. Um, what, what, what was behind that? And then what, what, did it cr what, what sort of dynamic did it create in this country uh, that left it ripe for your protagonists? Sure. So, you know, there, the, the transatlantic slave trade had gone on for several centuries by the time you get to the end of the 18th century. And in the Constitution, they make a provision that said Congress would not do anything about the transatlantic slave trade for 20 years after ratification. Everybody pretty much knew that after that 20 years expired, a ban would probably come into play. And the reasons for that are sort of complicated. Um, in some measure, there's moral opposition to the transatlantic trade. But there are also these complicated economic and, um, and political considerations involved. Um, economically, for example, um, most states had actually either restricted or banned the transatlantic trade long before 1808. Um, it, was, it, was, uh, uh, it was something that people thought was, had kind of outlived its usefulness. Um, it was something that states of the upper South realized that if there were no more imports of enslaved people, then they would be able to sell enslaved people who they already, uh, uh, they were already in the country. Um, and so when the ban comes down in 1808, you know, it's put in place at a time when people thought slavery might be losing momentum in the United States, but between 1788 and 1808, you get the invention of the cotton gin you get the expansion uh, uh, of the nation into the West, you get the Louisiana Purchase, all of a sudden cotton is the significantly much more profitable crop than people thought it was gonna be in the 1780s. And so what Congress does is they institute the ban in 1808, but by doing that, of course, they effectively create a protective market for uh, slave sales domestically. Um, and so that creates opportunities for really a slave trade industry to develop domestically. You, you know, I, you know, I, I had meant to, you know, I had contemplated this as I was uh, 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 reading um, uh, through some of your work that, you know, maybe I need to just tell people this is going to be sort of a disturbing conversation in some respects, because honestly, because like some of the and particularly when we get into uh, when they when uh, some of these uh, slave uh, traders that you, you, you write about, uh, are t you know, talking about uh, women like, the, the, you know, the, 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 the point of, of, of what you've written is to show how sort of brutal these slave traders and dehumanizing the, you know, the, the so we're going to be talking about uh, enslaved people as just like pure commodities um, uh, here. And I mean, I guess that's, that is the, the, the point. So what, le so with that said, and that, that sort of uh, limit on, how many slave enslaved people are going to be in the country at that point, which in, almost necessarily means like, OK, there's a finite amount of 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 enslaved people. Their value starts to rise once the demand starts to kick up with cotton. Well, when we look back on this era before we go forward, what are the myths that you um, that in, in many respects, I think you, you wrote this to dispel? So. You know, there are a lot of myths about the domestic slave trade and about slave traders that have really carried on since starting really before the Civil War. They really kick in uh, even afterward with the they become sort of part of the mythology of the lost cause. Um, I, I think there are probably several big myths that are worth dispelling. Um, one is simply the scale of the domestic trade. Um, one of the things that white Southerners often said before the Civil War was that slave sales were rare, 
They were something that uh, slaveholders really only turned to as a last resort reluctantly when they had no other choice. If you actually look at the domestic slave trade, it's simply not true. I mean, it's just a lie. Um, slave sales happened all the time in the United States. Um, they don't simply happen when slaveholders feel like they have no choice. They happen when slaveholders feel like they have different kinds of calculations they're making about their labor force, about their finances. Um, enslaved families are separated routinely. Um, I mean, somebody did a calculation on this in the, uh, um, in the 70s and calculated that essentially one enslaved person was sold somewhere in the United States every three and a half minutes for decades. Um, so that's one myth is that the, that the slave trade was something sort of off to the side and kind of uncommon. A second important one I think has to do with slave traders themselves. And this was something that white slaveholders said all the time, which was that sure the slave trade does happen sometimes, but that the people who are really responsible for that are the traders. Um, Traders are sort of these, these low lowlifes, the kind of the dregs of humanity. Nobody really likes dealing with them. And if you had to deal with them, you would certainly only do it in a business setting. You would never socialize with a slave trader. The, the idea was that they were sort of a necessary evil, right? Kind of social outcasts. But if you actually look at, uh, uh, at slave traders and at their status in the United States, again, that simply doesn't seem to be true. Um, it's, it's easy to say that you disdained people who were kind of fly-by-night operators, right? They might show up somewhere with people to sell. You never knew where they came from. And when they sold people, then they disappeared. You never knew where they were. But a lot of slave traders are not like that. They're not necessarily itinerants. They're established business people in cities and towns all over the country, um, they are respected business people. They have relationships with politicians and merchants and banks and slaveholders. Um, they, even after they get out of the trade, they, they marry into respectable families. They run for public office. Um, they sometimes go into other businesses. So they might run, um, you know, they might run hotels or get involved with banks themselves, things like that. So really the idea that, that the slave trade and that slave traders are somehow you know, they're, they're, they're kind of not really part of what made slavery and what made the American economy worked. If you actually look at the evidence, um, th those things simply aren't true. But there seems to be such a cognitive dissonance there, I mean, to put it mildly, like, I, there, there's no moral difference to me looking at it now between owning slaves and participating in slave trading, you know, what, how was that separated in people's minds during this time? And why was uh, one seen more unseemly than the other? Was it just because owning slaves was so integral to the United States economy? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And this was, there is some cognitive dissonance there. And it was, um, it, it, and you're right. I mean, in some ways, I think what, what you need to realize is that essentially every slave owner at some point is a slave trader. Um, almost every slaveholder at some point is going to engage in the buying and selling of enslaved people. So, you know, we look at it today and we say, well, what's really the difference, right? The, uh, the, the slave trade is not only something that happens because slave traders do it, it happens because it's, it's everywhere. Um, and that is certainly true. But part of the mythology is slaveholders telling themselves that their involvement in slavery was really about, um, uh, about paternalism. There, there's a mythology of paternalism that infuses ideas about slaveholding where slaveholders could tell themselves that, um, you know, that, that by owning enslaved people, they were um, uh, sort of improving their situations. Um, they were making uh, uh, better Christians out of them. Um, that they took care of them, they made sure that their families were not separated in the market. Um, again, it's a, it, the cognitive dissonance is a way of displacing what, are, what they told themselves were the worst elements of slavery um, onto a different class of people. But in fact, you're absolutely right. If you actually look at the way slavery operated, there's no sort of good side of slavery and bad side of slavery. There's just slavery. 
And the worst elements of slavery were always there. They're omnipresent in enslaved people's lives. Um, but this, again, this was a story that slaveholders told themselves and the ideas that they advanced about what the slave trade was were, were part of that story. It's almost as if they want to play it off like uh, I've just adopted somebody and, uh, you know, they're just now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm their guardian now, as opposed to I've uh, I've purchased this uh, this uh, person. And if it suits me uh, in the marketplace, I'll go back in and sell it at a profit. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's really a way in which they they're they're trying to tell themselves that slavery is not nearly as profit oriented and nakedly exploitative as it actually is. All right, so let's so let's um, go. Um, you know, the, the some of the characters that you, you you focus on to tell this story, and I should also say too that I I learned that by 1863, I think it was, or just the, right before the um, the, the Civil War. The value of enslaved people was greater than the nation's investment in railroads, banks, and manufacturing put together. Put, put together. Yeah, that's true. That, I, I mean, that when we talk about, like, you know, the questions of infrastructure today, uh, when we talk about the bill, like the, any, the idea that, like, you know, uh, uh, people could be part of infrastructure. That's what our uh, the first hundred years of our country was just exclusively. It seems like the biggest element of our infrastructure of our economy was enslaved people. Enslaved people are an enormous asset class before the Civil War. I mean, I, I it, it it really I and mean, like you said before, it is disturbing and and uh, uh, and really troubling to even to, to even think about people in those terms, nonetheless talk about them in those terms. But that you know, enslaved people. Uh, um, we often think of them as, uh, uh, to the extent we think about slavery and enslaved people, what their function was in American society, we think of them as a labor force. It's not simply as a labor force. Um, they are obviously a labor force that creates, uh, uh, um, you know, that, that is, is producing cotton, which is the, the, the largest export the United States had before the Civil War. But they're also an investment for lots of people. They could be mortgaged. Uh, they could be leveraged. Um, they could be uh, 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 sort of the underpinning of, of state bonds for banks. Um, and so they are, they are financialized as well. And, and yes, and it's, it's an, the, the val the, simply the, the financial value is enormous in addition to the labor value. So let's start with uh, Austin Woolfolk uh, in Baltimore. Who, is, who uh, was he and uh, what, what part does he play in this story? So Austin Wolfbook is in some ways, uh, um, in some ways, sort of the pioneer for what the people that I really write about would then do. Uh, Austin Wolfbook was a slave trader uh, based in Baltimore. Um, he is particularly active in the late 18 teens and into the late into the 1820s. Um, and he and uh, a number of brothers and cousins, these these businesses were often family operations, as a lot of businesses were in the early republic. Um, and he is really one of the first traders to create a big business by shipping people by boat along the coast um, from the upper south to the lower south. So he is sending hundreds of people at a time um, from Baltimore, uh, first to Georgia, then over to New Orleans. Um, he has a regular office set up in Baltimore. He is really sort of the leading slave trader in the United States in the 1820s. Um, if you read some of the autobiographical stuff of Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass talked about how, you know, Frederick Douglass was, was born and raised in Maryland um, and really talked about how Austin Woolfolk was the kind of person who, who really was a terror to enslaved people everywhere in Maryland, whether they actually came across him or not. They always knew that the prospect of being sold to Austin Woolfolk was a possibility. And then, uh, so uh, Woolfolk ended up being, uh, was he a direct inspiration? I mean, or, I mean, did, so when we get into talking about um, uh, Isaac Franklin and, and John Armfield and Rice Ballard, did they see what Woolfolk was doing and saying, uh, we can innovate in this area essentially? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so Franklin and Armfield, when they kind of get into, and they get into the slave trade at different points in, in time and different points in their lives, but they are really starting to get involved in Northern Virginia, um, particularly in, in the city of Alexandria. Uh, 
And you couldn't avoid Austin Wolfuck in those places. Everybody knew that he was the major player in the region. Um, and when you see as they start to develop their business, it's very clear that the kind of model that they are working from is the model that Austin Wolfuck had pioneered. Um, now, there's no actual sort of you know, letter that survived where they say, you know, we're going we're gonna to do what Wolfuck did, but we're going to do it bigger and better. But that really is effectively what they did. If you take a look at, at the way that they designed their business model, it really is taking a lot of the techniques that Wolfuck did um, and, and, and making them even larger, making them even more expansive. Um, you know, they, for example, they don't go into Baltimore at the very beginning because they realized that trying to compete head to head with him was impossible. So they try to set up a, a, a kind of parallel business in Northern Virginia. And then eventually that business gets so big that they actually pretty much put Wolfhook out of business. So, I mean, so what, so what were, um, what were some of their, their, um, I guess, innovations? I mean, like, you know, what, what did they do? They, they started to go, I mean, they, they realized that there was a trade here. It, it, it sounds like to a certain extent that they said we can actually not we can develop the market as opposed to just sort of serve it yeah so a number of things that they do and again a few of these things are things that wolf did right one thing they do for example is they establish a headquarters uh, a kind of regular office um, a lot of slave traders before austin wolf and then even continuing past the wolf era these were men who worked out of taverns bars hotels um they don't really don't have a kind of regular place of business. The, the, the taverns and hotels were the kinds of places where people did all sorts of business. So they set up shop there. Um, Wolfuck had a regular, uh, um, had offices in a house um, and he had a private jail that was connected to the house. And so Franklin and Armfield basically do the same thing. Uh, they rent this three-story townhouse in Alexandria. It's attached to an enormous compound out in the back where you could put several hundred enslaved people at a time. Uh, Franklin has a, 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 a sales end of the business down in Natchez, Mississippi. Um, and then in New Orleans, eventually they're running business, they're running sales out of both cities. So that's one thing they do is they, they create an, an official headquarters, right? So you knew that this wasn't a fly by night operation, operation. This was really a kind of regular place of business with regular businessmen. Another thing they do is they expand on the shipping element of things. Um, we often think of the domestic slave trade as working mostly over land. Everybody's sort of seen images of people being walked um, in long lines, in handcuffs, in, in these uh, caravans that were known as coffles. Franklin and Armfield did do that sometimes, but what Wolfuck really demonstrated was you could, if you were willing to pay a little more up front, you could cut the time involved of getting people from the upper south to the lower south in half. Uh, maybe even more than in half, if you send people by ship instead. And so Franklin and Armfield do that. And not only do they send people by ship, eventually they buy their own ships. Um, they have a small fleet of company vessels that they use. And at the peak of their business, they have a ship at sea somewhere almost every single day. Um, they are sending loads of people at the peak basically every two weeks. Uh, a, a shipment of people is leaving Alexandria for New Orleans. So that's a second thing that they do, but really what makes them uh, um, kind of most successful and that really is able to kind of put them at the top of their industry is, you know, Isaac Franklin had been working in the slave trade practically since 1808. So by the time Franklin and Armfield was founded in 1828, he's been in the business for 20 years. He's developed all kinds of relationships with, um, with merchants and with bankers in the Lower South. And what he realizes is that if you were willing to run your business more on credit than on cash, because most slave traders, it's a cash business. Franklin liked cash, all slave traders like cash, but he realized that if he could tap into credit lines from banks and have a lot of money at his disposal, then he could afford also to sell enslaved people on credit more than most slave traders did. And a lot of slaveholders and prospective customers, they love being able to buy out credit. Um, they love being able to have the person in their custody and then pay them off over time. So what Franklin and Armfield are able to do is they're able to make their business so big, not simply because they had so much cash on hand, but because they have access to enormous amounts of credit 
that they have flowing at any given time. And so they've got this kind of constant motion of money for enslaved people um, and being tapped into those networks really better than anyone else is, is really what sets them apart and makes them so successful. Are these innovations specific to, I mean, and, and they, are these innovations and, and, you know, they're basically, they've turned slaves into uh, essentially like, uh, you know, uh, machines that you would buy machinery, right? I mean, that's the way that, you know, uh, manufacturers will buy machinery is I'll buy it uh, uh, on a loan and I'll pay it off uh, over, you know, as to what the machines produce essentially. Was this new to, uh, slavery or was it simply like also a financial innovation that was sort of new to the world of capitalism right i mean like this is this is the develop we're, we're watching almost on some level too the development of capitalism here yeah i mean look what franklin and armfield are doing right i, I wouldn't say that slave traders and, and people like franklin and armfield are pioneering the idea of of of, of the way their credit operations run, right? This is something that's parallel in a lot of industries across the United States and really across the Western world as part of the early industrial revolution and the way businesses are running. Um, but it's, it's the application of it to slavery and the trade in enslaved people. That's what's really different about Franklin and Armfield in particular. Um, and obviously they're not the only slave traders who do this. They weren't even necessarily the first slave traders to do it. They're just people who do it a lot better than, than anyone else of their era. What banks, and are some of these banks still in existence today, were most kind of integral to this credit system with slave traders? Because, you know, I, a lot of this is whitewashed from the history of institutions like, say, J.P. Morgan Chase or whatever. I'm not sure when that came into existence. but uh, so, so, yeah, so, so. You know, I actually have not traced the genealogy of the banks that they worked with and tried to figure out, you know, none of them have survived directly, right? right? You, won't, you won't find any names of any of the banks they work with and say, this is the exact same bank then as it is now. Um, banks come and go, particularly in the era they worked in, in the 1830s, there's a lot of um, enormous amounts of money flooding into the banking sector in the United States, which also contributes to why they're so successful, right? There's, there's a timing issue here. Um, you know, economic panics and depressions come around that wipes bank, wipe banks out. And so banks could kind of come and go in this era. Um, probably the most famous bank that they, that they worked with, though, is the second bank of the United States. Um, it's, it's the bank that holds all the money of the federal government. And essentially what you have going on there is, um, you know, the, the money of the federal government before the Civil War mostly comes from a couple of places. It comes from customs or it comes from selling Indian land. So basically the process that's happening here is the federal government is displacing and dispossessing Indian nations in the Southeast. They're turning around and selling that land to white cotton farmers and pulling the money into the federal treasury. And then they're putting that money into investments, especially in the South and Southwest, which then goes to buy enslaved people. So it's this, it's this cycle where, where the, 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 the way in which that sector of the economy is predicated on these kind of multiple levels of exploitation and expropriation, um, it's, uh, uh, it, it's kind of remarkable when you, you sort of lay it out like that because it's, it's, the, the complexities of money are very complicated but the actual sort of process of what's going on here, when you boil it down to it, it's, it's pretty straightforward and it, it's, um, uh, uh, it, it's pretty awful. Awful. Um, the, so, and, and just to, to sort of like, um, I, I just want to examine that cycle a little bit and also, you know, sort of set the context in terms of timing, right? You have uh, Jackson is clearing, clearing. I mean, he's, 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 he's killing um, um, uh, Native Americans uh, basically, like you say, dispossessing them of that land. So that's function A of the U.S. government in sort of like creating this cycle, I guess, or this sort of um, this, you know, the system, which then allows for um, uh, cotton to to be uh, be grown there. And then they finance the the. The mechanism to do the slave trade, which is going to provide the labor 
to pick that cotton. So we have sort of like multiple subsidies of this whole process going through this, that the American government is just sort of making it work. And, and this dynamic on some level is also like, it's the same dynamic of imperialism on some level, right? I mean, just broadly speaking, we're doing that. We just happen to be doing it domestically or considering it domestic because it's contiguous to land that we're taking from other people anyways. Yeah, sure. And it's, this really is part of the expansion of an American empire, right? Um, it happens first with Louisiana Purchase, then it continues to happen in the War of 1812, then it continues to happen in the Age of Jackson. And of course, following the Age of Jackson, then it happens in Texas, right? And you get the Mexican War, and that is sort of the, the kind of the next stage of, of American imperialism. And the truth is that by the time you got to the 1850s, you had um, a, a, a sizable number of Southern slaveholders and Southern politicians who really imagine a kind of hemispheric empire of slavery. They have their eyes particularly on places like Cuba as places that might be uh, um, uh, uh, you know, taken and attached to the United States. They imagine that could, there could be places in Central and South America where slavery could continue to expand. So um, what you're seeing here in the 1820s and 1830s is not the first stage of the process, but it is one stage of this process of, of the growth of an American empire, absolutely. And let's talk just a little bit about the, <clears throat> the process of, of building, of, because now we have a finite number of enslaved people in the country, except for as people are being born into slavery, I guess, sure. as well. Um, and, and maybe you can help us with you know, what kind of numbers that is in terms of building the enslaved population. But um, these guys, um, Franklin and Armfield, also go around and and essentially uh, purchase slaves, and then there's some type of arbitrage uh, that goes on. Uh, you know, it's almost like like house flipping on some level. They 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 warehouse the slaves. They they literally fatten them up. Will you talk about that process of like how they sort of you know, get their slaves ready to be sold after and, and how they find them? Sure. So like I said, you know, John Arnfield has this um, townhouse as a headquarters that he's got in Alexandria. But of course, he can't be in all places at once. Right. He is um, he is sometimes, you know, in his offices in Alexandria. Sometimes he is out in town or in the ditch elsewhere in the District of Columbia. And bear in mind that the, the city of Alexandria at this point is part of the District of Columbia, right? So this is also part of the reason they draw so much attention is they are right in the nation's capital, right across the Potomac River uh, from, Was from Washington, D.C. And in order to kind of maximize the number of enslaved people the company can purchase, they have agents, um, basically uh, uh, sort of em employees of the firm who are often working on commission. And they are scattered out across um, Maryland and Northern Virginia. Um, eventually, they are in, they're in Baltimore. They're up and down the eastern shore of Maryland. They're out in the city of Frederick. They're in the city of Warrington, Virginia. Um, they station Rice Ballard in the city of Richmond. And Richmond is becoming itself a really important node for the domestic slave trade by the 1830s and becomes even more so later in the era. And essentially what they're doing, you can imagine uh, uh, kind of Armfield and Alexandria as sort of the center of a circle, uh, kind of the way I describe it in the book is they're sort of spokes on a wheel. And all of these agents are funneling people to Alexandria. Armfield will, as you say, sort of stockpile people in the compound in Alexandria. He will then put them on a boat when he has enough people and the time is right. Uh, the ship will then sail uh, down the Potomac from Alexandria out into the Chesapeake Bay. It will stop in Norfolk, where Ballard is sending people from Richmond down the James River to Norfolk. So they'll load more people in Norfolk. When the boat is full, they then send it down the Atlantic coast uh, around Florida up into the Gulf of Mexico to New Orleans. Uh, Franklin will then pick people up in New Orleans. Some people he's selling in New Orleans. Other people he's putting on a steamboat and sending up to Natchez, Mississippi, uh, which is sort of the um, is on the Mississippi River and is really a, a, a kind of major hub of the cotton trade uh, uh, in Mississippi and really in, in Mississippi, eastern Louisiana as well. Um, and then once you get people to Natchez, right, by this point, this is a trip that's taken about three weeks. 
um, to get from Alexandria to New Orleans, it, it's, it's the, the standard voyage is 19 days, but it could take a little bit longer than that. It's about three weeks you're on this, you're on this boat. Um, by night, you are uh, uh, locked below decks like you would be in the transatlantic slave trade. Um, by day, you're often sort of let out onto the deck. But nonetheless, by the time you get there, you're exhausted. You've been wearing the same clothes for three weeks. You're filthy. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of rations that you're going to get aboard a ship, I mean, even under the best of conditions, are not going to be great. So what would happen then is uh, Franklin would receive the people that Armfield had sent him. Um, he would make sure that they got themselves cleaned up. Um, Armfield always sent new clothing from Alexandria. They have a tailor shop in Alexandria where they actually make the clothing. Um, so they, they, they're given new clothing. Uh, they're given some decent food. They're cleaned up. And they're basically made to look as, um, as healthy and as uh, strong as possible. Um, so that when customers came, they, they believed that they could kind of project what they would be getting when they purchased a particular person. Um, and sometimes that means somebody is marketed as, as field labor. Um, sometimes it's marketing people with particular skills, right? They'd say, this person is a cook, this person is a blacksmith, this person is a carpenter, and you can sell people for a premium that way. Um, and yeah, and basically Franklin and Armfield are, are kind of making their difference uh, making their money on the difference between what they could purchase people for and what they could sell people for. Um, added on top of that, of course, is any interest that Franklin would get if the people were being sold on credit. And his sort of standard interest rate was about 10% per year. And we should say, like, they would put use wax to fill in um, uh, marks from being whipped. Or they would uh, dye folks' hair. or So use that, those were pretty standard practices in the slave trade, yeah. Um, now, now, whipping scars, really, there's only so much you can do to disguise that. Um, but what Franklin would have to do is he'd have to know, OK, look, you know, if I'm going to if I'm going to sell this person, I have to be able to come up with some sort of some sort of life story to explain this. Right. Um, and, and you had to explain away sort of marks of torture like that. Um, you, you really there, there's only so much disguising of those sorts of things that you could do. But yes, things like dyeing people's hair and things like that, those were pretty standard practices. So um, we, we don't have much time, but, but why, do you, why do you think that this has been, and, and I, I could ask this question about reconstruction, and I feel like we could ask this question about um, you know, the lost cause as well, but why has this uh, been, this history so erased? I mean, these guys were effectively billionaires. They were the, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, the, the billionaires of their time. They didn't literally have a billion dollars, but it would have been close, I think, in these in, in today's value. They were well yeah, I mean, h hundreds of millions, if you actually if you if you sort of estimate their fortune relative to kind of what GDP is now. Yeah, I mean, it would have been hundreds of millions. Yeah. And, and they are uh, completely, as you as you write, like um, uh, immersed in high society. They're not ostracized in any way. Um why, why, why is it so erased from history? Uh, I think there, there are lots of complicated reasons for why that would be, but the, the, the shortest version of that, of, of the answer to that question, I think is because, um, you know, the, the, the myths have been very successful in taking hold. Um, and it is related to the lost cause. Um, the idea that, um, that, that slavery maybe wasn't so bad as we thought it was, the idea that, um, you know, that, that slavery and capitalism were not as integrally connected as, as a lot of historians are, are, are coming to kind of re-examine. I mean, this is, not, this is not new, right? Things about slavery and capitalism are things people have been talking about on and off for a century. Um, it's, it, there, there are historians looking at that in new ways in the last 10 or 15 years, but the idea itself is not new. Um, but I think it's the kind of story that it doesn't flatter the nation and Americans, and we are not the only people who do this, but I think Americans in particular really like stories that flatter the nation and flatter themselves. And you can't tell this story in a way that is flattering to the way the United States developed. 
Um, and it's, it's one of those things that is, is easier to bury than it is to deal with. It's fascinating. Uh, the, these two uh, primary figures you're talking about, Armfield and, um, and Franklin, have no, um, at least, white descendants. Uh, no, di no direct white descendants. That's true. Um, so there's really, uh, I, I mean, it's, uh, w what of his, of their relatives in there? And, and, and they had one, uh, did they have one uh, direct black descendant? So each of both Franklin and Armfield had at least one, um, at least one child with an enslaved woman that I know of. Um, it's distinctly possible there are more, uh, Rice Ballard had a, at least one. Um, and probably more as well. I, I believe that Rice Bauer does have direct white descendants. I have not, I have not met them. Uh, I have met several of the descendants of um, uh, sort of relatives of Franklin and Armfield. Armfield, for example, raised several of Isaac Franklin's uh, nieces and nephews effectively as his own children. Um, and some of their descendants are still alive and, and, and I've met with them. Um, and you know, the, the, You'd have to ask them how sort of how they feel about, you know, being on the receiving end of this sort of story. Is the money there, though? I mean, I'm curious as to what that money's doing now. Yeah, the money is, you know, I, I haven't asked them, you know, you know, are you rich? <laughs> um, that, that, that's not really the kind of thing that I've gotten into with them. Um, I think really, you know, the, the, the money is in some way still there probably in certain family fortunes if you were able to sort of trace it down it's probably still there in some places but to me what's really more interesting and more uh significant than what particular family fortunes did these activities endow it's really that the money of the slave trade you know where is it now it's everywhere now um all of those people who were bought and sold and used to produce cotton all of the kind of uh, uh, ways in which their value as assets was leveraged for the, for the, the larger good of uh, hundreds of thousands of individual people and the nation as a whole, all of that money is still diffused throughout the American economy. We're still living on the other end of it now. Joshua D. Rothman, uh, professor of history, University of Alabama. The book is The Ledger and the Chain, How Domestic Slave Traders Shaped America. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate it.